It is so good to be with you. This is my penultimate day in Australia. I've been here since the 4th of January, and it's just wonderful to be here in your summer. When it was all being organized, I said, I'm not coming in our summer because we don't have a summer anyway, but um, <laughs> it's just been great. And Perth, I adore. It's just the most beautiful city, including your beaches. Well, I am half Aussie. So going back three generations, my great-great-great-grandfather was serving on a ship. Uh, he was only 17 at the time, but he had a captain who was actually very, well, he was drunk and quite vicious. So when they arrived at Port Phillip Bay, Victoria, moored because they had to be quarantined, he decided to jump ship. And initially he got caught, got put in a ship's dungeon, and then he jumped ship a second time and swam to Queenscliff, which was quite a swim. Uh, yeah, I, obviously those of you who know that area. Shark-infested waters, you know, it's rough, etc. But he landed on the shore and uh, started to live there. And then 10 months later, another ship came in with some um, women who were going to be working for the government. And he met and, and married um, Emma, and the rest is history. He established our family in uh, Victoria. So it's great to be back here. But basically, I don't know about you, have you ever been put in prison? Have you ever been put in a lock-up situation? I mean, I know COVID was lock-up, but <laughs> partic particularly in London, you know, we were only allowed out one hour a day. And I used to walk up and down my stairs thinking, I'm glad I've got a house with stairs, because at least I can exercise. But I've never been incarcerated. But in this passage that we, oh, we've just had read, Paul talks about how we've been rescued from the dominion of darkness, and we've been brought into the glorious kingdom of Christ. And he says it's for this reason that he prays that our lives will be worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, and growing in our knowledge of the Lord and being strengthened with all his power. Every year, January 1st, I always say to the Lord, I want this year to grow closer to you, to grow more in love with you. I want to have that passion of Jesus flowing through my being at increasing measures. Because then, if intimacy with him grows, then we will grow in our faith, we will grow in our wisdom and understanding, and we will reflect a life that is pleasing to the Lord. The world needs us to reflect this light and this hope and this love because the world is in great trouble at the moment. I mean, I don't have to say it, but that's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Going back to 1994, uh, when Dean introduced me, I'd been a Christian then for 14 years. I you know, was living a life following Jesus, but I don't think I was as passionate as I could have been. And the Holy Spirit was moving powerfully around the world at the time. And I received prayer, and basically, I fell in love with Jesus in a brand new way. I had what I call the googly feeling in my tummy that rose up, and then I had this cry from my belly that went, Whoa, Jesus! <laughs> now, I'm quite a sensible person, you know. <laughs> I'm a nurse by profession. I, I was a sister in the hospital, you know, uniform, hat, the whole thing. And I don't normally do that, but the wave of passion for Jesus went over and over and over again. And this went on for months. And at that time, we started to do Alpha conferences all around the world. And I traveled with, he's now a bishop, Sandy Miller, and our, at the time, curate, Nikki Gumbel. And I would be called up onto the stage when uh, Sandy was doing the talk on how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he'd say, well, um, just come up and just tell us your testimony. And as I was giving my testimony, my sort of woe Jesuses would happen over and over again. And people started to be filled with joy and filled with sort of the excitement of what the Spirit can do. And I remember at the time, the Holy Spirit saying to me, I want my people to be excited about my ministry. Because it's the ministry of the Spirit every time that transforms our lives. And at the time I said, here I am, Lord. I don't mind where you send me or where I go. Now that's a dangerous prayer. <laughs> um, but I was so thrilled because actually 
If I look back at my life, I can genuinely say that um, the Word of God says, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord orders his steps. And I had no idea that prayer, here I am, Lord. Three months later, I would be invited by Nicky Gumbel to take a team down to Exeter Prison to introduce the Alpha course. We had Alpha in our church. His girlfriend was doing Alpha. She rang her boyfriend and she said, you've got to do Alpha in prison. And he went to his chaplain and they rang through, got to Nikki, and Nikki said, my diary's full, but I know someone I can send because I was working in Holloway Prison, which was the biggest women's prison in London. And initially I said, no way, Nikki. And he said, what do you mean, no way? And I said, I've only ever worked in a women's prison. I've never been into a men's prison. But basically, um, Nikki is very good at persuading you. We call it being gumbled at HDB. <laughs> and I was truly gumbled. He said, just ring the chaplain. He sounds really nice. So on December the 14th, 1994, I took a team of seven people down to Exeter Prison. And this man was sharing a cell with his dad. They'd been caught importing five tons of cannabis worth 13 million pounds. At the time, it was the biggest drug haul in UK history. But um, they went on to do the Alpha course in January of 95. And in the UK, if you are a big time criminal, you don't spend your whole sentence in one place. So they did Alpha there, then they got transferred to Swellside Prison, and the duty of a chaplain is to go around and introduce themselves. And um, these two men, father and son, said to the chaplain, do you run Alpha in this prison? And the chaplain said, what's Alpha? Oh, ring Emmy at HTB and she'll bring a team. So God used two serving prisoners to spread the Alpha course. I was just running to keep up with the Holy Spirit. I, I, it wasn't my idea to, to do this, but it was God's idea. And I have to say that it's been the best 30 years of, of my life. I actually got ordained in northern Uganda in 2011 by a, a northern Ugandan bishop who had been the chaplain of Luzira Prison. And he said, um, I'm not ordaining you into a parish, either in London or in, in, uh, in Gulu or Uganda. He said, I'm going to ordain you as chaplain to the prisons worldwide. So from my nursing career to doing what I'm doing now, I have to say, it's the best ministry. And just this week, I've been in Wooloroo um, and also in Kasarina and uh, launching the Alpha Course. And in both prisons, well, in Wooloroo, they all came forward and gave their lives to Christ. 20 men, week one of Alpha. I know. And in Kasarina, nine out of 10 did. So honestly, that is fruit. And that's what Jesus wants us to bear, is, is fruit in our lives. I remember once on a three-day mission, we had um, Nicky Gumbel as one of the team. And I remember him saying to me, Em, what happens if there's a bit of violence or we get sort of kidnapped? And I said, well, Nicky, that's why we pray. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're doing prison ministry, you pray. And um, he was preaching from Ephesians 2, and he was just saying this. As, this is Paul obviously writing, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And all the men in the prison were going, yeah, that's us. We're, we're, we're dead in our transgressions, uh, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And then he continued, but because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. And they were going, yeah, that's us. We're alive in Christ. You know, in prison, people know they're sinners. I hate to tell you, often the church doesn't really know they need to repent. Um, but at least in prison, they really do know what they have been up to. Well, I can say that because I was like that. When I prayed my sinner's prayer, I remember thinking, I don't need to pray this because I'm not a sinner. I mean, how arrogant is that? Anyway, I've learned since that I am. So, But the word of God holds such power. A few years ago, I was... Um, we were praying in our Lent series, and we had sort of longer extended worship and prayer. And we were praying beforehand, and the Lord spoke to me. He gave me one word, and the word was twitch. So I've learnt, if, if you're given a word, to go back to the Holy Spirit and say, what's this word twitch? Are we all going to be twitching in church tonight? And immediately, I was, uh, the Holy Spirit said, no, it's an acronym. So I said, what is the acronym? And the Holy Spirit said to me, T-W-I-T-C-H stands for the word in the center of your heart. And if you have the word in the center of your heart, then, of course, you have Jesus, because Jesus is the word. And I can't tell you how much people in prison love the Bible. So on another three-day mission, the um, chapel orderly was called Finney. 
And Finney always had his big Bible under his arm like this, and he'd be doing the chairs and you know, passing out coffees and things like that. And one day I said to him, Finney, you know, why don't you put your Bible down and then you've got a bit more sort of movement? And he said, because it's the sword of the Spirit and at any time I can wield it into your life. <laughs> and I went, whoa. <laughs> and he used to write letters. And in the letters, you know, he would find verses from Micah and Obadiah and um, Joel and verses I'd never really sort of picked up before. And I remember looking up the, on the, in the Word, thinking, yeah, he's right. He's actually quoting the Bible. But then there's another guy I did a three-day mission with who was, he had 15-year sentence for murder. His name was Chris Lambrianu, and um, he told us the story that one day he was in his cell on this life sentence, and he was just broken. And he saw under his bed uh, this book. He picked it up, blew off the dust, and then he started to read it. He just opened it up. And he thought, wow, this is so good. There's so much truth here. And that night, he used it as his pillow because he thought, I want the information that's in here to go into my mind. And then the next day, he shoved it down his tracky bottoms so he had the word with him at all times. Now, do we do that? Do we read the word as if it's our life? But we need to depend on it because that's how God speaks to us. So let me introduce you to two of my friends. Now, this first uh, photo is of someone called Eddie. And Eddie, in this photo, is broken. He was uh, brought up in children's homes. He was in and out of youth uh, detention centers and then adult prisons. He was an alcoholic, a full-blown drug addict, and he was dying. He had hepatitis C. Living on the streets of London, he'd come down from um, a prison sentence in Glasgow, but was living on our streets. And he came um, once to do the Alpha course, but he was so drunk, he just couldn't, as it were, take anything in. Then he tried the next Alpha course, still too drunk. But on the third Alpha course, he came. And on the Holy Spirit uh, weekend away, someone laid a hand on him and said, come, Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God touched him in a powerful way. And his life just started to change. And this next photo is um, Eddie on mission. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> so we have... Um, a sweet couple in our church who are actually Harley Street psychologists, that you can't go higher than Harley Street. And uh, they run a home group for a lot of our ex-offenders and also people who are addicted to drugs. And Eddie joined that group. And uh, in the days when we started to do global alpha trainings all around the world, the home groups were asked to lead these, these trips. So the leaders decided, um, because they were invited to go to California, to Skid Row in Los Angeles, which is the place where a lot of drug addicts live. And this is Eddie on mission in Skid Row, teaching the local pastors how to run the Alpha course. So you can't go much better than that, can you? Um, Eddie started to come in on prison visits with us, and he was just so powerful giving his testimony. And then I got invited to go and speak in Germany. And this photo is Eddie. As soon as we landed in Nuremberg, we, we were taken by the pastor um, to visit this drug den. And these two men leaning over the wall are both heroin addicts. And Eddie was translated, he had to be, he doesn't speak German, but actually he did. He bought a German English Bible just so he could do his best when he was meeting people. It was so moving. But this is Eddie leaning over the wall and telling them his testimony. So he continued to grow and grow and grow. And now this next photo is Eddie. Yes, I used to wear robes when I was at this church. <laughs> In fact, I used to swing the incense. How about that? Um, but this photo, if you think of your um, social media platform, has been the most uh, noted photo in my Facebook um, uh, group. And um, the other person is a guy called Paul Carley, who I brought on staff two and a half years after I'd started the prison ministry. But we needed someone that Sunday morning to carry the cross. And so Eddie was so proud, not only to put on a surplus, but also he walked up the aisle carrying the cross. It just makes, he makes me cry. But do you know what his job is now? 
he runs a homeless shelter in London for people who are on the streets. So from being homeless, he now runs a homeless shelter. Is that fruit? Is that bearing fruit? Yeah. My next friend is someone called Shane. Now, if you've done the Alpha course with, do you do the films here? Yeah. So Shane appears on the Alpha film series, but with permed hair. <laughs> And actually, Paul Carley said to him just before they filmed it, you're going to regret the fact you had your hair permed. And you know, he has regretted it. He, he looks at me and he goes, I can't believe I did that. But um, this, this photo was taken um, by Q magazine, which is uh, an international magazine. And uh, he's looking pretty stern there, because that's what he was like. Um, for those of you who don't know his story, he actually started his uh, criminal career when he was five. <laughs> and um, by the time he was 11, he was in and out of young offenders um, and in and out of adult prisons. And when he was in an adult prison one day, he actually managed to break, um, I don't know how he got the glass, but he broke a bottle and he stabbed two prison officers. Now, if you stab a prison officer, it's a complete no-no, as you can imagine. Um, and he spent three years locked in solitary confinement in one cell, and there was a hatch that had to be unlocked to put the food through. And if ever he had to come out of his cell to, for any reason at all, it required seven armed officers in full riot gear, shields, helmets, everything. And after three years, he was moved onto a wing, and eventually, um, one day, he was um, on his way to what he thought was the education department, but he ended up being pointed into a room, and it was the chapel, and they were running Alpha. And he sat at the back, and he thought, what would God want with a scumbag like me? And he was about to get up and leave in the break, and the team said, we're about to serve chocolate biscuits. He said, I'm staying. <laughs> if your tummy is fed, you know, that's a good thing. So he came back every week for the chocolate biscuits, not for any other reason whatsoever. And on the Holy Spirit Day, he was prayed for, experienced nothing, taken back to the, his cell with all the others. And um, the chaplain heard God speak to him and say, I want you to go and unlock Shane and bring him back to chapel and pray for him again. And the chaplain said, but God, this is Shane Taylor. You really want me on my own to have him in... Yes, said God. So you have to be obedient. So he went and unlocked him, brought him back. And um, on this occasion, the chaplain basically just explained the gospel to him again. And he decided at that point to give his life to Christ. And as the chaplain laid a hand on him on this occasion, he talks about this bubbling feeling that starts in his belly and then comes up. And then he bursts into tears and he sobs uncontrollably for 20 minutes. Now, you know, he was a big guy. He did not sob. And the chaplain then needed to take him back. So he handed him a Bible and said, you're going to need this now. So um, he goes back to the wing, and normally the officers would be like, here comes Shane, be careful. You know, they really did fear him. But Shane goes up to the officers, and he goes, Jesus is real! Jesus is real! Jesus is real! And the officers go, whoa, what's happened to him? But he was a Saul who became a Paul at the moment of conversion. And immediately he started to read God's word, and within weeks, he became the chapel orderly, which is a sort of privileged position. And after 18 months, he uh, finished his sentence, left prison, met uh, a girl called Samantha, who's tiny. I mean, he's six foot three or four. She's tiny. And the next photo is they've had five children um, named Angel, Grace, Jacob, Isaac, and Elijah. And, you know, Christmas... I don't know, those of you who have kids, they've probably opened the, the, the presents under the tree before you've woken up, but he insists they stand on the landing, and before they even go downstairs to open their stockings, they thank Jesus for Christmas. Now, that, I think, is remarkable. So, um, I heard about Shane. I heard that he was a very violent man. I had a newspaper clipping about, about him, and I needed... I've always needed to, to, to take team with me when I do a prison visit. 
So I asked a chaplain in Risley Prison, which is in the northwest of the UK, can I bring this guy, Shane Taylor? Now, normally I would always know the team because you have to vouch for them, but I'd never met him. And the chaplain was very brave. He said yes, because he'd heard about Shane. So we met in the prison in Risley, and um, he told me his testimony over the lunch break. And I said to him, Shane, I want you to give your testimony before the final talk, how can I be filled with the Spirit? So he gave this very, very powerful moving talk. And I then came and stood beside him, and I said to the men who were in the, in the chapel, I said, if any of you believe that God can transform your life as he has transformed Shane's, I want you to, and before I could say come forward, they literally got up off their seats and they ran forward. And I said, I turned to Shane and I said, Shane, pray a prayer. He said, how do I do that? I said, just say something. And he prayed a salvation prayer as if he was an expert. (laughs) And the men said, amen. So I started to take him on more and more visits. And then I said to him, Shane, you're going to need um, a passport. He said, why? I've never been abroad. I said, you will need one. About two years later, this is 2018 by now, he emails us at HTB and he says, I've been invited to do a TEDx talk in Luzira Maximum Security Prison in Kampala, Uganda. I don't know how to get there. I need someone to take me. So I thought Paul Carley, being a guy on the team, would take him or one of the other men. Paul's diary was a bit full. And so he said, Em, you were ordained in Uganda. You take him. So um, the next photo is uh, Shane and me at Heathrow Airport. Someone had to bring him on the tube to Heathrow because there are two different exits for the different terminals. He literally did not know how to, which one to go to. We checked in and he got upgraded and I got so excited. (laughs) He said, why are you excited? I said, Shane, it means you've got a bigger seat, you get better food. And he went, oh, okay. (laughs) So we flew to Uganda, and on the first Sunday we were there, um, we went into Luzira prison, and he met with all the lifers who, many of them will never leave that prison. And we got into the car, and he was so moved by what he'd seen. And then midweek, we went into the prison, and um, have you ever seen the Shawshank Redemption? You know the aria that's played over the prison radio? We had two opera singers who sang that aria in Luzira prison at this TEDx event. And there were two and a half thousand prisoners seated in a courtyard and about 500 dignitaries. They always have huge chairs they sit in, including the Lord Chief Justice of the the criminal world. And um, Shane was the third of of six to speak. And he did this brilliant 15-minute TEDx talk. And when he talked about being filled with the Spirit, he literally just sobbed. Now, when a man does that, every time they talk about receiving the love of Christ and the forgiveness of Christ, it is so powerful. We had a coffee break straight after he spoke, and if two and a half thousand men could have all touched him, they would. They all gathered around him, and again they said, if God can change a man's life like yours, maybe he can change my life. I took him on a safari um, because I thought he can't come to Africa and not go on a safari. And uh, we had a a wonderful time, including um, being as close as I am to the sun desk to a hippopotamus, which, as you know, is one of the most dangerous animals in the world. But but Shane was thrilled. uh, And we've even got a picture of us standing on the equator with me in the north and him in the south, um, just smiling. So... Yes, so next photo, please. This is actually my bishop, Bishop Johnson um, Kagumba, who ordained me. Uh, I always have to wear clergy robes when I'm with him, but he came all the way down from Gulu, which is a six-hour drive, just to meet Shane. And, you know, when someone's life has been as transformed as that, you want to be able to meet them, because um, you know that lovely verse, iron sharpens iron. And when you meet people who really speak into your life, it can really affect you. And then uh, the the final photo is is of Shane and me at the Prison Ministry Conference in 2016. He comes down to London whenever he can. In fact, he's spoken at the Leadership Conference at the Albert Hall in front of 5,000 people, um, sobbed as he gave his testimony. Um, But he is an extraordinary man. But I, I would want to say because otherwise it wouldn't be real. He struggles. 
you know, he is still living in the Northeast where a lot of his criminal friends still live. He's trying to live an upright life. It's not easy. And the one thing as regards people coming out of prison is they need us, the church, to care for them. We were so naive. We, we thought when people were coming to faith, coming out of prison, the church would go, welcome. We know pastors who've actually said to people, we don't want an ex-offender in our congregation. Oh, God, forgive us. You know, because these are my brothers and sisters. You know, when people came to faith this week in the prison, I said to them, we have the same heavenly father. You're my brother. And you can call me sis. And as they file up, goodbye, sis, they say. I mean, that, isn't that precious? You know, that we can, have, we can say that. So we've started to tra train churches to care for ex-offenders. Because fear is the one thing that will hold any church back. Because people think people in prison have two horns and a tail and, you know, that they're these strange people. But actually, they've all got, like Shane, a big heart just waiting to receive the love of Christ. But they also need mentoring, discipling. They want to live an upright life. And it's absolutely vital that the church picks this ministry up. Because it's not a case of if you visit people in prison. Jesus says when you visit people in prison. And I have to say, all of us are criminals in one way or another, we just haven't been caught. <laughs> you know, we've all done things wrong. I mean, not big things necessarily. But we need to know that these people need loving and caring for. So how do we bear fruit? My challenge is always to us all, to lean into Jesus. But as God uh, revealed to me when I was nursing people with HIV and AIDS in the 80s, I had a very judgmental attitude towards people who were living in a lifestyle I wasn't familiar with because it would be normal to hear people, either they got AIDS through drug addiction, but sometimes it was through a very promiscuous lifestyle. And I would hear people say that in one night they might go to a sauna bath or a Turkish bath and have sex with up to six different people. And I had to sort of wire up my jaw. And um, one day I was waiting for a patient to come in to have a <coughs> bronchoscopy, which is the way you diagnose HIV. And I was talking to God and saying, no wonder they're sick with HIV. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, you're judging. I said, yes, but God, it's disgraceful how they live. I mean, I was very arrogant and very proud. And God said, I died for them just as I died for you. I love them just as much as I love you. And I prayed a grumpy prayer, which was, God, if I've got to love these people, you'll have to change my heart. You know, God likes you to pray a grumpy prayer because he knows he has to answer it. And I know that if I hadn't asked God to change my heart, how could I walk into a prison and pray for a pedophile or a murderer or a drug baron or whatever? And um, you're going to laugh. When I got ordained, I did have to do one year's theological course at, at, at church. And at the end of it, um, the uh, sub-dean of St. Melitus College went round the room of all the people who'd done the accredited course and started on his right, I happened to be seated on his left, so I was the last, and he asked everybody, have you enjoyed theology? And everybody said, oh, Mondays is the best day of the week, can't wait for the weekend, can't wait to get to college to study theology. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, you've got to be honest, you've got to be honest. <laughs> so it got to me, and my remarks were, do you know, I'd rather be in prison than study theology. <laughs> So, and that's true. I truly, truly mean it. I found theology so boring. I mean, I love God's word. Anyway, that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, but let's believe that if we lean into Jesus, if we lean into his word and learn from it, and if we are led and empowered by the Holy Spirit, nothing is impossible. Yes. Nothing is impossible, whether it be work colleagues, family members, homeless people. God can transform anyone and everyone yeah. by faith. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand.
and let's just respond before we return to worship. If you're like me and maybe your heart is um, grown a bit cold or, or brittle um, and you want God's heart of love and compassion, I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to come now and pray for us all. Because whether it be just weariness from unanswered prayer or whether it's just seeing on TV screens the wars around the world, or whether it's just because we don't realize that God can transform us. I'm going to ask the Spirit to touch us all now. So if you want to receive, just either maybe put a hand on your heart or put out your hands. Holy Spirit, thank you that you transform our lives. You take us from darkness into light. Nothing is impossible for you. You can break into our lives to free us from anything that has bound us. Why don't you just at this moment say, Lord, I want to be free from whatever you want to be free from. It might be anger or hatred or unforgiveness, fear, addiction, whatever it is. Take this moment and say, Lord, I confess I need your help. I repent and I ask you to come and empower me to live this life that you long for me to live. And I sense the Lord saying, I hear your whisper. I know you. I love you. I want the very best for your life. As you know, a tree, when it's first planted, the fruit tree doesn't bear fruit, but it does over time. So, Lord, would you, in our lives, bear good fruit, fruit that will last, fruit that will be appealing to consume. Lord, we, we pray for the fruits of the Spirit to grow in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control. Lord, grow those fruits in our lives so that everyone around us sees that fruit and comes to know you, Jesus. Do a mighty work, Lord, in and through our lives, through this church, in Perth and throughout Australia, Lord. Let your spirit sweep across this nation. We cry out to you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.